All right, so what are we doing? Diver down here? Diver down. Diver down, diver down. Diver Van down. Halen's fifth album. Right, released in 1982. And this is when they started really getting a lot of exposure, especially on MTV. And uh, their first official sanctioned uh, music video for Pretty Woman. Which it's unfortunately, that's like one of the standout tracks on this album. It's one of the standouts. There's there's very few standouts on this record because, like we we've talked about before, this is just a uh, kind of a placeholder album. Yeah, it's, it's filler. It's a it's a contractual obligation type thing. Does it always seem that an artist gets a a really big break with a recording studio and then they get tired of it and they don't want to be stuck to a contract with that recording studio, namely Warner Brothers in this case, because there's also the story of Prince, which we could talk about too. <laughs> About getting out oh, of a geez. contract and then finally changing your name to an unpronounceable symbol. Well, what did Eddie want to do? He wanted to do his own thing at 5150? Yeah, I guess he wanted to get away from the, the, the recording studio process because it is very, very expensive to record at other studios. So he took his money and basically started building 5150. He started, he actually, he bought the, the, um, the property around the time they were doing Fair Warning. Then he started putting all of his gear in around the time of Diver Dan, and then he brought the band in to record for 1984. Makes perfect sense. I mean, I guess if you were as creative as Eddie, you wanted to get out of the studio and build your own so you could do your own thing and have no one scrutinize you. Did he, um, do you know, after, I mean, I know he worked with Sammy Hagar on a solo basis, but what, did he produce anybody that we might know about or anything like that? Who? Ed, yeah. Who? Eddie? Uh, not off the top of my head. Nobody I know. I about. can't think of anything that he might've actually produced unless he just kind of wanted his own, you know, musical laboratory to score around in. I would probably say he just wanted his own little laboratory because like, I mean, look at what came out of that. 1984 came out of that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. So if you have, Rather than renting the equipment and then getting to play around on it with it on a on a very limited basis, an hourly basis, and it costs a lot of money, you just have all the equipment. Then you're free to take your time and score around and do things and come up with these amazing sounds that he would come up with. I mean, Cathedral is a really good example on this record because he's screwing around with his guitar and he's making it sound like a pipe organ. I mean, it's incredible to listen to, really. It is. I mean, I love uh, the intruder intro that goes into Pretty Woman. That's awesome as well. That's your one-two punch. Because he's because because he's making like those those strange noises with his with his guitar and everything. It's really it's a really experimental instrumental. There are two one-two punches on this record. There's um, Intruder and Pretty Woman, and then there's Little Guitars, and they're both really great. I I, I love both those songs. As far as like, you know, there's something very strange about the sound of this record because it doesn't have that big, you know, ball crunching. It's got a little bit of a sound. wall. Of, it's got a wall of sound on it, though. But it's it's it, it feels flatter. It feels like there's less bass. You know, you can hear it. You can hear there's a lot less bass on, on these songs than there was on, on Women and Children First and possibly Fair Warning, too. But again, Fair Warning kind of had its own signature sound that would never be replicated again. This is kind of like 1984 light 1984 gets heavy again right this is sort of along the lines of 1984 but not as big it's not as big of a sound for me well that and they weren't even ready because again this whole album is pretty much half covers half original shit yeah and they and, and it's the end of their it's the end of their five-year plan their five-year plan included fair warning everything that was on zero right and there's there's a couple of riffs i think there's a hang em high riff on zero but they they just they just sort of use the riff to launch into that song. Makes sense. I mean, so so I guess with this album, it's their seminal goodbye album because this is like every demo we've ever had from like the early '70s up to now has been recreated in some way, shape, and form. At least with this, we can start fresh. Yeah, and it says it, you know, and then try something completely different. Well, this this was recorded. I mean, the recording time, if you will, quote unquote, was between January and March. Of 1982. That's why I think a lot of the stuff might actually be outtakes. What do you think about that? Uh, I mean, that's a maybe. Okay, the best example I can give you. You a big System of a Down fan? I've heard. I've heard a few songs of theirs. Yeah. So I, I assume you're familiar with the album Toxicity, right? Like that was their big break album. That's the one they had Chop Suey, Toxicity, I know, Aerials, I, I, whatever. I know a little bit about that record because I actually know a couple of people 
who uh, were at the studio when they were recording it. When I was working okay. on when I was working on a documentary back a while back ago, they um, there's a there's a guy I know I know named Steve who uh, has his own band, and he was he was in a studio at the time that they were working on it. Okay. Well, the example I'm I'm trying to make is literally right after Toxicity comes out, and like in the 2000s, this is kind of unheard of. Mm -hmm. Like literally a year later, we got a brand new System of a Down album. Right. Okay. And and it was steal this album. Now it was molded and modeled to look like a bootleg CD. Oh, okay. But like half of the album was like Toxicity outtakes, and then the other half was new material. Yet, as far as I know, no one said what's what. Yeah. Like no one said what was created for that record, what was and what was like a B side, an outtake, or like a demo that evolved into something else. Well, if you have like you got like what you got, where have all the good times gone? That's a kink song, right? Then you have Pretty yes. Woman. Um, Intruder is original, of course. Dancing in the Street, another Intruder. cover. So that's three, and then you have Big, Big Bad Bill, Big Bad Bill, four, and then you have Happy Trails, which is a joke. As Dave David Lee Roth says, joke them if they can't take a fuck. <laughs> which is that's you know i mean like they were just screwing around but they screwed around with happy trails before happy trails is on one of their demo their Ted templeman demos too so it's possible that they could have recorded some stuff earlier on like say in 81 maybe all through 80 or something like that i could see them screwing around during women and children first yeah may maybe some maybe some of those other songs are like outtakes or experimentals from the prior sessions they were put on diver down and then instead of just like oh yeah we'll just do all these covers to give the album some filler yeah or maybe they were a fair warning outtake well yeah you know? thematically the the record is a mess compared to the other records this this one it, it, this is they they were starting to become really really big Really, really big at this point. They were all over MTV. Remember the Lost Weekend? Well, I don't know. This was before your time, but MTV oh, um, way before my sponsored time. the Van Halen Lost Weekend contest, and the winner got to party with Van Halen and hang out with him for a whole weekend. And I remember the winner being, um, I, I forget, but I remember having MTV around the time they had that. But then this, this, this record is out, and they're really starting to make a name for themselves. They get a million bucks for doing the U.S. Festival where Dave can't remember the fucking words, you know, <laughs> to the song. Uh, I think it was, uh, what was it? Um, Ice Cream Man? No, no, it was Romeo, Romeo Delight. Okay. He couldn't remember the, the lyrics to the song. I can't, hey, everybody, I can't remember the fucking words, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so it was, uh, it, it, it was becoming a really big, they were already becoming kind of a, kind of a big super inflated rock act with an, with an enormous crew and a big stage. And they were out there all the time. And they, you know, it just seemed, it seemed really that they were having probably more fun touring than they were making albums at this point. But Eddie, Eddie always seemed to have a plan and he always be one of, want to be putting out an album. And he, when they didn't want to do it, he went out and he recorded the guitar solo for Thriller. Yeah, and that was in '82. That was right. That was actually right around Diver Down time because, uh, what was it? Thriller wasn't released until November '82. I know Diver Down was released before that. Yeah, Diver Down. And was And you even said Diver. April. Yeah, Diver Down was reported in a two-month span between January and Mar March of '82. Mm. So he had plenty of time to go mess around and do the do Thriller, or to do a uh, beat it. Sorry, <laughs> do beat it. Do beat it. Yeah, I mean, it was just it was just sort of like, and he did it for nothing. So they were like, you want to come down and do this? And he was like, yeah, sure. He just wanted to work. You know, for years, I always thought Eddie like did the whole guitar on there. I didn't know it was one of the dudes from Toto who actually played the uh, rhythm guitar. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah, he did the, the solo. The solo is signature. It's a very signature piece. And it's, you know, you would know you, you, listening to it. You're like, whoa, that's Eddie Van Halen. You can tell he just sort of has that thing about him, the way he performs. He, he, he has a trademark sound like Jimmy Page had. Like, uh, um, who else? Uh, Pete Townsend had, like, you know, like George Harrison had, like uh, Steve Vai, uh, Je yeah. Jeff Beck, you know, people like that. They just, they have a style about them. Ace Frehley, you know, people like that. I mean, hell, even Joe Walsh, like freaking uh, Joe Walsh. What is it? Joe Joe Perry, Joe Ferrell, Perry. So he's got a signature style. Yeah, and that, that's sort of what you're going. You're, you're going for the front man, yes, but you're also going for that that signature style. That's what you really, that's what you're really enjoying about a band when you're hearing. Yeah, bass and drums are very important too. I'm sorry, Michael and Alex, but uh, but um, 
Uh, th- it's a fun record, but it's not serious. It's something I can play. I play. I played it last week. I played. I played a little bit. Uh, um, I played it on Christmas Eve, while I was making uh, fondue. It's really good to huh. music to to make a fondue to. Yeah, that kind that of. That should be the name of your autobiography. What? 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 Uh... Music to make fondue to. Well, that's pretty good. Okay. The li- the life and times of David Law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chapter five. I'll put a recipe in for you. It's like four different kinds of cheese. You got to throw in some white wine. You got to rub the inside of the pot with garlic. With you cut a garlic and piece in half, rub the inside of it, pour some wine in. There you go. You got yourself a stew going, baby. Um. So what 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 are the standouts for you on this record, my friend? Well, obviously, Pretty Woman. You know, I like Dancing in the Streets. A lot of people don't. I actually like that cover. Um, it's kind of disco isn't it? Man. It's got a disco thing yeah, to it. Yeah, it's got that disco. Little guitars, dude. Little guitars. Senorita, I'm in trouble again. Yeah. And Cathedral. Yeah, okay. I'm going to You know, I mean, when it comes to original compositions, I really, I love Hang em High. I love The Full Bug. The Full Bug makes no sense. <laughs> It's a great. <laughs> that song. was my problem. I don't. I, I like the covers more than I do the freaking original jams. And it's like I could tell you all the covers, but it's like the original songs in eh, are not that great. I mean the instrument. I mean little. Uh, save for little guitars. Save for little guitars. Little guitar. But it's kind other- of like it's got a. It's kind of like a. Uh, it has a Rick Springfield quality to it, like pop hard rock. You know, there's a lot of pop yeah. in this record too. You know, it has like a very pop feel to it. Pop sense. I mean, it's not, but it's not. It's ter- it's not Van Halen three. OK, it's no. not Van Halen three. Nothing will ever be Van Halen three. No. But unfortunately, you're going to ask where I put this. I think it's above balance. Thank goodness. I mean, I think it's a better album than balance. I'm going to have to check my list here. I, have... I got it. Yeah, I got it. I was making a list and check. Yeah, it yeah, twice. yeah. I mean, a diver down for me is third from the bottom. Yeah, I'd say I think without I got to double check my list. But I think it's about third from the bottom, too. Yeah, I'm checking it's, right now. It's uh, under balance and above a different kind of truth. Yep, I was correct. I was correct. I was third from the fucking bottom. Third from bottom. Hey, we agree on this, huh? Yeah, unfortunately, man, did I muck up my list. I said B- Balance was a better album than Diver Down. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have Balance above Diver Down, too, actually. Yeah, I don't know. I gotta When I listen to Balance again, it'll it'll make, make more sense. I tried listening to it recently. I couldn't get through it. I will it's try. Just... I will try again for this podcast. Of course, <laughs> for me, it all kind of goes downhill after for unlawful carnal knowledge. Yeah, that, it's literally like it's gonna be nothing from here on out. It's a cakewalk. I know the rest of the albums, note for fucking note. Once we get up to balance, that's where it's just like fuck. I got to listen to this shit. Well, for me, okay, you know, I um, a lot of this is a joke. You know, Happy Charles is a joke. Big Bad Bill. I love. I love the sound of it. I love. Jan Van Halen clarinet. He's the dad on Big Bad Bill. They, I, uh, David Lee Roth was, was had like a shortwave radio, and he tuned it into some Kentucky station, and he, w- he wound up picking up Big Bad Bill, and he said, man, let's buy the rights and cover this. So <laughs> they just did it. I mean, it was just like, fuck, we got nothing else to do. You know, I love little guitars. I think it's great. Dancing in the Street. Unfortunately, the thing with Dancing in the Street for me is this cover came out a little too late for me because the Mick Jagger, David Bowie cover, had come out during Live Aid in 1985. So I had already heard it, and I had already heard the song, and I thought it was a weird variation on the tune. You see, I'm I'm glad that I never heard the Mick Jagger, David Bowie version first. <laughs> and you don't want to see so, the video oh, either. Oh, the video. Oh, yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, Family Guy, for showing me that fucking first <laughs> music video. With the dancing. <laughs> yes. Uh, dude, per- seriously, I never heard, never saw nor heard of that until Family Guy. And I was like, man, I'm glad I heard the Van Halen. Where he version says, first. and now we present the worst music video ever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pretty Woman is iconic, of course. We've heard it in so many things. The video is fantastic. I love that video. From what I understand, David Lee Roth directed the video, too. Um, it's just sort of... <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it's PC anymore, though, the video, when you look at it. Oh, no, nothing from the 80s is PC anymore. No. Nothing. And is. we're not even talking girls on film, which I don't even get the big freaking deal about. Uh, uh, Intruder, of course, the intro. Uh, Secrets... Secrets is an okay song. Again, it's another one of these kind of pop hard rock songs from the early 80s. Cathedral, wonderful, beautiful. Hang em High, love it. Love that riff. Where Have All the Good Times Gone? Uh, Ray Davies. That's actually a good opener. It's a good opener. It's okay. Ray Davies doesn't really care for the Van Halen covers of his songs, even though they increased his own record sales. So go figure. Yeah. Joe Jackson which, said the same thing about Anthrax, and the thing is he's still counting his money. 
Oh, no, there's another one. Uh, Freaking old 55, the Eagles did that for the On the Border record, and John Waite originally did that. Mm-hmm. John Waite hates the cover version, nah. yet I, I prefer the cover. You should hear um, Duran Duran's cover of Fuck the Police. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, dude, I love the dope cover from the uh, Fuck the Police. Dope cover. See, that's, that's, my, that's my era. Dope is my era. That's like uh, new metal, uh, hard, like uh, heavy metal. That's new metal with an NU, right? Yeah, that's NU metal. NU that metal. Right <laughs> uh, well, none of these people would be where they are today if it wasn't for Van Halen. And this record, Diver Down, how's that for a segue? Uh, next time, I guess we'll be talking about 1984, which came out in 1983. Chant- no, it came out. Actually, it? it came out the first. It had a copyright of 1983 because it came out the very first week of 1984. Aha! Uh-huh. So they had to print it first for to yes. put it on the record to make it seem as though it was 1984. Sorry about my Russian. Uh, all right. Well, this was a lot of fun. And um, fuck you, Skype. Fuck you very <laughs> much. <laughs>